Thank you and good afternoon. I, I think I will probably go down as a lady with a with yellow earring. So, and uh, I, I found the earring on a market uh, in, in Amsterdam uh, two years ago, and I'm very fond, you know, and sometimes you can get very attached to uh, an item that you find, and not because it's pricey or expensive, because you just feel that it fits your, your identity. And, you know, I decided to have a bright color uh, where we have all these serious issues that sometimes I notice when I have dark colors that brings me in a, in a, in a more deeper type of uh, mood. So I wanted to bring a bright color uh, in uh, these uh, winter months. And I am Jorien Wuyte, a name difficult to pronounce, a very Dutch name, however. Uh, and uh, I'm indeed a member of parliament. Um, I lived in the Caribbean for many years because my mom is from, uh, from the Caribbean, from St. Martin. And, uh, but I was born and raised in The Hague, uh, followed my studies. Uh, I've been an interim minister of education, culture, youth and sport after the passing of Hurricane Irma on St. Martin. I've been a minister plenipotentiary in uh, The Hague uh, for a while for the Kingdom uh, Council of Ministers. And I'm now indeed a proud member of uh, Democrats 66 since um, the end of March 2021. 2020, so with that uh, introduction uh, by myself, uh, <laughs> I would like to say uh, distinguished guests and audience to this forum. It is an honor to be invited to your yearly conference. I feel privileged to be part of this panel together with such a wide group of speakers varying from leading figures from international politics, diplomacy, science and education, and civil society, and even practitioners indeed in the, film of, in the area of film and music as we know as just now, and visual arts through our photographers. We are speaking with each other to share our perspectives on this year's theme, and of course, art and film for democracy is related uh, to indeed tackle and discuss growing threats for democracy around the world. And what we share with each other is our interest, our shared belief and value to bring people together, to connect and to build cultural bridges for a better, more beautiful, more prosperous and yes, more peaceful world. As my party Democrats uh, 66 believes and invests in the expansion and the power of the cultural and creative industries and cares to place more emphasis on international cultural diplomacy, I'm proud to be the spokesperson on culture and on the arts, uh, the orange economy as I dub it, and kingdom relations on behalf of D66 in the House of Representatives in The Hague, the city of peace. Rightfully so, this Academy for International Cultural Diplomacy highlights that for decades, all forms of the arts has served as powerful, effective ve vehicles to inspire and enable people to build cultural bridges and come together towards more prosperous and peaceful relations, and that the arts have the unparalleled and transformative strength to continuously affect people and over time sculpt human society closer to the ultimate goal of global peace. I'm a first timer to your conference, and in consultation with the conference organization through Mark, we decided to choose the beauty of the orange economy for more community, for democracy and peace as the title of my speech. And this title is related to who I am, what I firmly believe in, and what I focus on through my political work as Member of Parliament in the Netherlands. And I'm one of 150 representatives of the people in the Second Chamber in The Hague. And through my Caribbean roots, my slogan this last year has primarily been, and in Dutch, hashtag vergeet de eilanden niet, hashtag don't forget the islands, is, has been my slogan. To, to explain why, we of course need to be aware that while we refer to the Netherlands as solely a European country, in actuality and in international affairs, the Netherlands is a state officially named the Kingdom of the Netherlands, consisting of not one, but four countries, of which three are the Caribbean constituent countries, Curaçao, Aruba and St. Martin, with a total approximate amount of citizens of 350,000. And in addition, since 2010, the Caribbean islands of Ceiba, Stacia, and Bonaire are special municipalities and part of the Netherlands. And some of you may be familiar and may have visited or are about to visit the beautiful islands. Uh, and um, 
As you can imagine, those islands are under growing extraordinary challenges for sustainable development. And that's why, indeed, my hashtag call to action. The existence of the Kingdom of the Netherlands relates to the history of colonialism and the manner in which the decolonization process resulted in the highest law of our state, the Kingdom Charter, consisting of four countries with Dutch borders close to Venezuela and Colombia with growing issues of security and geopolitical challenges in the LAC region of Latin America and the Caribbean. So due to these historical circumstances, I was born and raised in The Hague with my mother from St. Martin, who came to further her studies in the 50s. I worked in the Netherlands, I lived in the Netherlands, I studied in the Netherlands, but then I spent a good part of my adult life and professional career on her native island. And cultural anthropologists therefore sometimes pro profile me as a kingdom child. I'm from here and I'm from there, with a more cultural, diverse Caribbean identity. And so why I say all of this is that is what I will explain later when I explore the practical case of intercultural diplomacy within the Kingdom of the Netherlands, not a foreign country, but within the Kingdom of, uh, of the Netherlands, intercultural diplomacy is also a relevant issue. And also my call for more orange economy. But before I get more personal about the Caribbean and the or orange economy, I believe that I also should briefly highlight my party's position on culture and the arts, and as well as the Dutch international cultural diplomacy that has been applied these last couple of years. As D66, we have always had the strong conviction that arts and culture lay at the heart of our society. Arts and culture provides us with the opportunity to critically reflect on our past decisions as a society, and it has the potential to shed light also on the way forward. In the past two years, so much has happened that has had a fundamental impact on our societies and the individual lives of citizens. Of course, I'm talking about the pandemic, but also a war has broken out on our European continent as we've been discussing uh, throughout the day. And our global security is more and more threatened by climate change. In addition, our societies are becoming more and more divided between the haves and the have-nots. There is a large group of people on our, our continent and also in the Netherlands whom are struggling to deal with the effects of globalization and the ultimate result of all of this is turmoil, of this turmoil is citizens turning their backs to each other. People have become more distrusting of our political institutions and more importantly uh, of the others they dis distrust. And unfortunately our answer as politicians and as policy makers have not yet been convincing enough to turn, turn that tide. In part, I believe, this is because when politicians explain their choices, they explain themselves primarily using facts. We try to convince citizens using sciences. We show the statistics and we provide data. And this is absolutely necessary, but it just seems to be not enough. And politicians, as politicians and policymakers, we need to be able to also emotionally convince societies and people. We need to be able to emotionally connect with the people who have turned their backs on society. We need to be able to communicate on an emotional level rather than only on a scientific level. And this is where, in my opinion, we need creativity. This is where arts and culture play an absolutely critical and crucial role. With film or with music, you, artists among us maybe here uh, in this audience, are able to make us see the unseeable you allow us to imagine the unimaginable, allow us to understand and feel for issues that feel disconnect from our everyday experience of the world. This is for me and my party the fundamental value of arts and cultures and why we should cherish it deeply. And having said that, I feel that the theme of this conference, of course, could not have been chosen more accurate because arts and culture are crucial to democracy and peace worldwide. And this is also a pillar in the Dutch international cultural policy with 23 focus countries and a budget of more than 14 million. This policy has an objective varying from a strong position of the Dutch cultural sector, sector in the world, the use of Dutch cultural expressions to support bilateral relations with other countries, and also the power of the cult uh, cultural and the creative industries for the SDGs, 
the Sustainable Development Goals. And to illustrate, the Dutch Ministry of Foreign Affairs has supported various artists around the world whom have worked on making the effect of climate change more tangible. Great examples of this are, for example, the Mexican artist Gilberto Esparza, who has, with support of the Dutch government, worked on an innovative Dutch design project to protect the coral reefs in the region. The documentation of the project is an art project in itself, as it promotes awareness. Another example is a traveling exhibition of a Dutch artist who has been traveling around the world to document the rising sea levels globally. His exhibi exhibition warns for entire cities disappearing and millions of people fleeing as a result of climate change. It is in this very concrete and artistic way that the cultural field contributes to making the crisis of the future more tangible. And in this way that I think that the field contributes to hopefully more stability and peace in the future. So it's not only my party's firm belief that the arts are essential in fighting the crisis, but also Dutch policy to recognize and prioritize intercultural diplomacy through foreign affairs and its international cultural policy. So let me uh, bring it a little bit closer, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Even though, as I mentioned, the Caribbean part is technically no foreign country to the Netherlands, these islands and its citizens have feel forgotten. And they often feel as secondary citizens, being in an entire different region of the Americas. So therefore, kingdom relations in our parliament and the political debate are often described as problematic, as uh, complex, and with sometimes heated debates due to key items being its history, the small scale and other characteristics caused by the capacity issues challenging good governance, the rule of law, democracy, crime and corruption, as well as finances, economic development, and a supportive investment for climate adaptation strategies. As a non-independent small island development state, we see that the islands are more vulnerable to natural sh shocks. I've experienced it with the passing of Hurricane Irma, to the devastation that I've seen there. And of course, stagnant economies and growing poverty and political instability in the entire region. The Kingdom delegation therefore recently participated at the United Nations General Assembly and they drew attention to the special position of small, small island development states and thus the specific challenges that the Caribbean parts of the Kingdom are faced with on a daily basis. The Minister of Foreign Affairs recently recognized it and through those words of recognition, they came after growing tensions due to financial loans, more dependency with an enforced reform agenda that was not politically acceptable to the parliamentary representatives in the Caribbean islands. And there were therefore growing result, um, complaints that even reached on multi by multilateral organizations such as the United Nations with complaints against discrimination. And throughout the years, it seemed difficult to discuss sensitivities that influence our kingdom relations, such as the colonial history and the Dutch role in the slave trade system. That changed last year, and you may have noticed it and heard. After an extensive parliamentary consultations and a very important speech with formal apologies by our prime minister about the Dutch role in the transatlantic slave trade system as a crime against humanity. Can we consider this to be examples of intercultural diplomacy as a soft power to engage in a more constructive and a more emphatic relationship with the Caribbean islands? Or maybe in addition, is this part of a greater strategy to re-engage with the Latin American and the Caribbean region to win the minds in this region due to a new geopolitical era that we are in? Following the formal apologies, our royal family recently visited the Caribbean islands last month. And we've seen extensive media footage of the Queen, uh, our Queen, the Princess, and even the State Secretary of Kingdom Relations dance during carnival celebrations and other cultural activities. There are people that may not understand the value of these artistic expressions of culture among the warm and the cold part of the Kingdom of the Netherlands. Uh, it is an expression for the people to build mutual understanding and more respect. And therefore, I consider the formal apologies and the further initiatives that will follow this year, the opening of cultural funds and a cultural attaché with the help desk function, as well as the dancing queen and the dancing princess, to be good practices and samples to follow, to build bridges, 
to understand, to connect, and ultimately add more value to something that we consider, that I consider relevant, and that is the principle of one kingdom of the Netherlands, een koninkrijk, un reino. A community with different cultural heritage, yes, diverse in nature, but with a common ground to apply principles of equality, of solidarity, of mutual respect, inclusion, and unity. And it is my hope that these visits and more diplomacy and dialogue and creative exchanges support the need to re-examine kingdom relations actually in the 21st century. Because we can conclude, of course, that the Caribbean islands maybe were thought to seek independence, but I think that conclusion can be drawn that that is not going to be the strategy for the years to come. They will probably remain part of the Kingdom of the Netherlands. And therefore, a new way of re-engagement is necessary with everything and the turmoil that we see in our world. A critical question in this regard is how we can ensure that cultural diplomacy influences citizens here and in the Caribbean for the purpose of political, social and economic interest in the entire Kingdom of the Netherlands. And for more identity and that sense of community, regardless of your European or your Caribbean heritage, I just mentioned that there are large uh, groups also of pe people with Indian descent in uh, the Caribbean islands and also of Chinese descent. My plea, therefore, ladies and gentlemen, is to engage and expand in the orange economy, part of the title of my speech. It is a term that originates from the Luck region. Yes, orange is, of course, also the color of our kingdom of the Netherlands is part of our logo and the color of our logo. But also orange is also a fruit with a lot of juice. And it is vivid. And it is a vibrant color that symbolizes creativity and it embodies radiance and renewal, something appealing for a younger generation. And that is why it is no surprise that culture and the creative arts and the industries fall therefore under the orange economy, a term that was introduced by the Colombian author Restrepo. We see a growing numbers of experts worldwide, worldwide advising to expand and develop creative ex economies as part of economic diversification of a very sensitive and critical region. And it is meant to indeed apply those efforts to stimulate economic growth and create more stability, more prosperity and a more well-being and use and apply the creative talents that we see in the area of uh, performing arts, that we see as dancers, as film, as music as de and design, and a younger generation that display the interest and the ability to ultimately reimagine our world for the decades ahead of us. They are able to see the value of the arts and culture to apply to different social themes, such as health, mental health, the ability to indeed secure through culture, culture and arts um, and support mental health of a younger generation, especially after the pandemic, but also issues related to security and polarization and how indeed culture and the arts are able to build bridges once more. It's even so that creative design organizations have been reaching out to political organizations such as also my, my uh, political organization actually asking and encouraging us whether they can assist to ensure that we're going to reimagine the world and reconsider our ideologies to frame them according to current developments necessary and whether the ideologies of the 20th century are still renewed enough to face indeed the challenges of the 21st century. So it's very interesting to indeed be approached by these creative thinkers actually encouraging us politicians to reconsider and allow them in to avoid that we go on an automatic pilot and indeed focus on what was earlier mentioned, the, uh, the power struggles uh, that we often see in, uh, in politics. Ultimately, it's my belief that through, therefore, expanded cultural diplomacy and also the orange economy uh, that we uh, can uh, that we can even apply on an international level, that it can contribute to peace, a better in level of engagement of different people from different walks of life, and how I mentioned also earlier, uh, in more understanding and more community. And more community is more peace and understanding, and ultimately, hopeful, hopefully, also supportive towards democracy, but I, of course I realize that much more is necessary when we discuss matters of democracy, which to my opinion is not a noun, but it is a verb, and therefore it's always in action and always in development.
So my closing argument, uh, ladies and gentlemen, is let's go orange to be able to emotionally convince and to reimagine societies and reconnect with citizens as well as countries for more democracy and peace. Thank you so much. Thank you very much indeed. As you know, the ICD is not only an organization that organizes conferences like this, but it's also very much into education, as we can see by the young people in the back who are enrolled in programs like academic programs in the ICD. So what we do here is not only to provide content, but we also learn from experience what people do who are professional. And what situation did we create here? The ICD didn't know who's going to be the moderator. And it is a situation that you might find shocking if you would be in the shoes of a speaker. You expect this to be different and then you have to improvise. And what we got both in your title as well as in the way you introduce yourself is that people use pictures that are often much more powerful than words. Mm -hmm. You use orange as something to remember and then you build metaphorical a message around a very powerful visual instrument. And you also do something that makes you stand out from a long list of speakers because you even create what Edith Piaf used to say, use your faults, use your defects, then you're gonna be a star because you lost an earring <laughs> and you will always be connected with the woman with the earring, which is also something like a brand of a country that currently hosts the largest Vermeer exhibition of all times yeah. with a masterpiece, which is the girl with a pearl oh. earring. And now we have the direct connection that shows that wasn't that the talk with a woman with the earring and color and orange we'll and uh, huh? exactly. we will we'll never forget. forget. So this is what I strongly recommend to keep in mind, not only what has been said, but how has it been said and is there something I could use for myself in the future and being perfectly flexible and improvise if people forget how to introduce properly. Now we even know more about you than anyone who would just read a bio could ever get across as a message. So thank you very much for teaching us both what your talk was about and also how to perform professionally on stage. Now the floor is yours and you can ask questions. Overwhelming. No questions. Nothing well, what, what I found very important, also in the way it was designed, what we do, we had for so many talks, the elephant in the room is the war. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, the rest of what we are working on doesn't stand still. So it's very nicely designed that we are now moving from the focus that you put to what Ms. Lopez is presenting on gender equality later on and we keep going with a Swedish perspective in the afternoon that if we take seriously what just has been said about what Europe needs to learn about the challenges that are a matter of survival, how do we balance these things? So I'm sure you have also different layers of discussions in the political sphere. Will we hand on leopards? and support Ukraine, and at the same time, how do we finance the pressing needs that you just yeah. used as an example in what matters more to people because it's about their lives and what can we do with cultural diplomacy? So can you say a bit more about the ongoing discussion in a country that is not bordering with Russia, and at the same time, how do you communicate to the people what your orange message is when we put it in a broader global context? First of all, of course, we, we, we have to recognize that uh, in the Netherlands, uh, the war uh, between Ukraine and Russia is, is, um, is felt, uh, is understood, and it's also debated uh, in, in our political arena. Um, the overall majority uh, unites and, and supports. What we see at the same time, if, if we took, take, and of course the Kingdom of the Netherlands where it comes to the Caribbean part is rather small and irrelevant when it comes to European policies. I notice that when, when I sometimes partake in interparliamentary uh, Kingdom relations conferences that take part in 
sometimes uh, 8,000 kilometers further down, further on the, uh, on the other side of the, of the ocean, is that then the war and all the issues with regards to democracy are not felt, and, but they feel the consequences of it with the extraordinary rise of, of prices uh, uh, for, for fuel, for food, uh, and therefore with growing, uh, growing poverty and instability following a, a pandemic. So um, that, is, that, is, that is one, uh, what, what I want to mention. And at the same time, um, um, the orange economy, uh, as discussed in, in various, um, by various speakers, uh, is related to hope. Uh, we, ta we distinguished um, fear and hope. And um, of course, you have to be realistic and, uh, and honest about all the multiple crises that we're faced with. But at the same time, there's a wish, especially by a younger generation, is that message of hope. Mm -hmm. And I do believe that the orange economy, when I go to performing arts, when I listen to music, when I see film and their ability, as I mentioned, to reimagine, uh, it is necessary in order to um, re, re, sometimes reconstruct uh, things that are necessary to be reconstructed when it comes to climate related issues, um, but also um, when it comes to matters of um, uh, the war between uh, Ukraine and, um, and, and Russia to, um, to ensure that our society in the Netherlands remains open and supportive and, solid and uh, uh, displayed solidarity. That, that means that the manner in which indeed Ukraine's refugees are brought to uh, the Netherlands, are able to par be par uh, participate in our society, are able to work, uh, or for instance, where it comes to indeed um, artistic people are a able, e even able to display their, their, um, their arts. Uh, we have dancers, uh, we have new type of productions, Dutch and Ukraine <coughs> productions. So these are some of the samples I believe that I would <coughs> respond to. Is this my water? I guess so, yes. <coughs> In your answer. Sorry. Thank you very much. Anyone else? Comments, questions? <coughs> If I not, a sign that you have to wrap up. because we had <coughs> a later start, I got the signal that I should hold mm -hmm. myself back and not come up with further questions, no. although I have a number, because to me the Netherlands also appear as kind of a role model when it comes to living together in diversity and being multicultural, which is also something we have to get ready yet for what is more to come with all the urgent challenges and probably more migration that Europe will face. And if we start from this is us and this is them and we are not ready to integrate, then it causes even more problems. But if we successfully integrate, then everyone who's integrated also has a reason to insist on this is my way of thinking and this is what I insist on, and I'm not the deviation from the norm, and the titular nation defines yeah. what's right and what's wrong, which causes even more problems, and not necessarily that we speak with one voice, that we should do according to the strong message that the president of Lithuania sent. So that would be something I would have loved to discuss, but yeah. from what I hear, this is more something for a face-to-face -face conversation, or if you would just like Maybe to one thing. comment on this. Yeah. Yeah. I, I do believe that indeed uh, in the Netherlands the matter of, of inclusion and diverse societies can be displayed better as, 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 a, as samples for the future. In addition to that, I also believe that uh, um, global and, and geopolitical uh, developments uh, indicate that uh, matters with, re with regards to raw materials uh, and the needs and, and therefore dependencies of the entire European continent to its other parts of the world, uh, be it Latin America or the African continent, are currently reconsidered as well. Uh, and that therefore uh, requires a different type of dip diplomacy and, and therefore not only a view inside uh, to be busy with Europe only, but to have a much more open um, and um, uh, interactive approach towards other continents. Uh, if I see, for instance, Latin America and the Caribbean, <coughs> a growing amount of signals 
uh, reports and advices highlighting matters of growing insecurity uh, due to, I mean, we focus now on, on, on Russia and, and Ukraine, but let's, let's also talk about the real big, big power play of, of China. They are increasing their influence in other regions as well, and that causes uh, yeah, the risk of, of discomfort for, for Europe uh, and their ability to, and our ability to uh, maintain wealth, well-being, uh, and, and riches. That's what I also see in some of the additional crises, not only related to the war and energy, but also related to raw materials uh, that are required from the African continent or from Latin America. Uh, if uh, China is able to flip uh, uh, s small islands uh, for economic and political uh, purposes on a multilateral organizations, you see that the Latin American region is also growing uh, in importance. For the Netherlands, we emphasize, I'm, of course, I'm the permanent chair for, uh, for the permanent committee uh, of um, uh, de uh, development cooperation and foreign trade. And there we, where we see that the Africa strategies uh, is uh, growing, uh, of growing importance uh, to, for economic and trade purposes moving forward. So I do think that Europe should also always have their eye on the rest of the world and use cultural diplomacy to have, um, yeah, to define different type of relationships, not only within the Kingdom of the Netherlands, but also with, therefore, other continents. Thank you very much indeed, and please join me in a round of Thank applause you. for our speaker. That was excellent. Thank you so much.